Hello and welcome to It Started With A Kick, the podcast in which well-known fans and high-profile figures from the world of football talk about the first ever match they attended. I'm your host, Richard Foster, and I'm delighted to introduce today's guest, Kieran Maguire. Kieran is something of a a modern-day everyman, straddling the worlds of academia and modern media. So not only is he a senior lecturer in accounting and finance at the University of Liverpool, specialising in football, and I think uh, I'm going to put it out here, he's the first senior lecturer on this pod, and he may be the last. But you never know, you never know. But he also is the author of a book, uh, co-author of a book called The Price of Football, which is an excellent book, and I've got one over my shoulder here, and Kieran's got one over his shoulder there. Uh, It's everywhere. Uh, But that spawned the hit podcast of the same name, which he co-hosts with Kevin Day, who coincidentally was on this pod just yesterday and will be following in the weeks to come. I'm not here to promote other podcasts, but I've got to say I would recommend The Price of Football for anyone who's interested in football, interested in finance, or if you're interested in both, it's a sweet spot. Um, before we go into that all-important first match, Kieran, we need to declare that we are from diametrically opposed ends of the football spectrum. You are of a Brighton and Hove Albion persuasion, whilst I, like Kevin Day, have the good fortune to be a Crystal Palace fan. Palace fan. Uh, but we're not here for petty squabbling. Or rivalry. We're here to learn about your first match, which interestingly did not involve Brighton. So take it away, Kieran. Um, well, I was born in the Elephant and Castle in South London. Um my old man wasn't a football fan. And I'd started to to watch football on match of the day and the big match, you know, living living in South London. Um, my uncle Terry, because I'm, I'm from a uh, yeah Irish heritage background, so we've got an awful lot of people in the house, you know, various <laughs> uncles and aunties, and God knows who else. Um, my uncle Terry was a huge Millwall fan, and I probably would have become a Millwall fan had my mum allowed me to go to mm-hmm. the old den, but. Yeah. My mum knew who Uncle Terry's mates were, and, and Uncle Terry, I think it was where uh, he, he was classified as a lovable rogue, um, with right. the emphasis on the rogue. Um, yes. And therefore, what he got up to at football would, wouldn't necessarily was what, what my mum wanted a, a seven or eight year old little boy to be. And also, Uncle Terry would do it because he was he was my hero, and he was my uncle. But I think he probably wouldn't want me around when things got a bit tasty either. So um, yeah. it, instead, uh, my first match was at uh, White Hart Lane. Uh, it was uh, West Ham versus Arsenal. It was 1970-71. Um, and I just wanted to be there. Yeah, I just wanted to go to a match. And uh, I went with my other uncle, Uncle Tony, who was a West Ham fan. Mm-hmm. And we just uh, well we, we just had this joyous experience and it was uh it was a case of uh getting there and the noise you know it was a, it was a decent crowd it was a sunny day i had a i had a rosette on i probably had a rosette with leeds united or manchester united i, I don't know or england <laughs> it doesn't matter but i remember but you know he bought me a rosette yeah. and uh I, I don't remember anything of the football apart from the fact that it was it was loud, and uh, it was it, it was it was the start of that that contract that you sign with the game uh, when you go to that first match. And I just knew I wanted to go be going back on a more regular basis. Indeed, um, you did. Met, you you actually. <clears throat> I have to pull you up. You said White Hart Lane. But I, obviously it was sorry, hard, sorry, but... sorry, sorry. No, so I mean, you know. For the sake of accuracy, yeah. uh, unless suddenly Arsenal had moved to White Hart Lane <laughs> briefly. But um, 
looking at the match actually because I, I was like researching these things you know being a journalist you sort of you, you have to do that uh, it's in your DNA um, Arsenal ended up winning 2-1 uh, Eddie Kelly and John Radford scored this was actually say in mid-April there was only one other league game left so they, they finished it uh, on the 18th of April as a league Um but the, the scorer for West Ham is the one that interests me. It was Jimmy Greaves. And did you have any idea when you were watching it? As you say, it's very difficult to remember a game when you're eight and any of the details. But was there anything that stood out for you amongst the players? Greaves being obviously a superb player who just missed out because of an injury at the 66 World Cup, but was... Still, in a, you know, he'd, he'd made his reputation at Chelsea, gone to Tottenham. But actually, he, I found out when I was looking at it, he swapped with Martin Peters. Mm. So he joined West Ham, Peters went to Tottenham, and that broke up the holy trinity of the West Ham uh, three who won the World Cup. Was, was there anything in those players where you thought, oh my goodness, he's he's pretty good? Um, I knew that my uncle Tony worshipped him. Um, but uh, I think it was fair to say he wa he wasn't at the the peak of his career at that particular well, point. Um, you know, it, fo football was brutal. And if you had the skills of Jimmy Greaves, the way to deal with that was to kick lumps out of you and then keep kicking yeah. lumps out of you. That there wasn't the protection that we have in in modern day football with regards to the protection of of a a, a gazelle in a, in a herd of wild in a herd of rhino, which it, which he effectively yeah. was. Um, but I do remember my uncle Tone saying, "Just watch out, watch out for Jimmy, watch out for Jimmy." And it's one of those matches where he he, he going, "Well, what's all the fuss about?" Because mm. yeah, a bit a bit like Gary Lineker, he he didn't do anything for most mm -hmm. the vast majority of the time. He he wasn't like uh, yeah. I I remember watching Liverpool a few years later, where you'd have Dalglish and Rush. You know, happy, the the first time, the first indoctrination of of the press, as it were. Yeah, Jimmy yeah. Greaves didn't do that. He he sat there, hands on his hands on his hips, looking a bit bored, and then. <laughs> The ball would come near him, and he, he would he would come alive. So, yeah. I mean, I, I can't I can't remember the nature of his goal. It it, it wouldn't have been a thirty yarder because no. that's that's not what Jimmy Greaves does. Um, but it was seeing these people who, uh, you know, like like kids at that time, you read about them and you'd watch match of the day, and we you know, we we were we, we were a relatively a poor family, so we had a black and white telly, and to actually see the vibrancy of the colours of mm -hmm. you know the grit, the, well, the grass wasn't that green; it tended to be rolled mud, even even yeah. by the time we got round to April. Um, but to see all of the colours and the atmosphere, uh, I think that was what that was the thing which really struck me. And and of course, the kits themselves were were nice and simple in those days, mm, clean. Uh, no sponsors, all that sort of stuff. Because also, you, if you look at that West Ham site, as I say, you've got Jeff Hurst, you've got Bobby Moore, captain mm -hmm. of the England um, 1966 winning guy. Jeff Hurst is called a hat trick. You've got Frank Lampard Sr. I mean, you've got some pretty good players there in front of you for your first taste of a football match. Uh, Ron Greenwood's the manager. And then if you look at Arsenal, you've got Frank McClintock, you've got Charlie George, uh, George Graham. Now, I don't know. You said you had a rosette. Did you, did you ever pick up a program for that match? I I certainly did at the time, but yeah. you know what, whatever happened to it is you know it, it got scribbled on, <laughs> no yes. doubt by me. Or I was uh, I think when I got home, I got out a pen and I changed the names of the players to the real names uh, right. because. That's what you used to do because you didn't have a phone and you you didn't have this sort of this instant updates and access to to data. Um, but uh, I I I do I do remember getting one. It, you didn't it, keep it, was, it though. Did, didn't keep it. It was 
uh, you know, I was I was a scruffy kid and disorganised, and I'm now just a scruffy old man and disorganised. <laughs> well, I've got news for you because I managed to track it down. Oh my word! So uh, this will be being sent to Maguire Towers. That's incredible. Post post this podcast. Um, I, I'm feeling quite emotional now, actually. Oh God! I'll be happy. It, it's, it's very sweet how you know I, I had this idea and I've done it for a few people and, and they all get very you know so sort of, it touches you. Yes, yeah, it, it, it is it this does. moment. And I've got to say, how entertaining is it to read a program? There are some beautiful things in here, like. The admission prices for 1970-71. I don't know if you could guess this, but a season ticket in the lower tier East Stand would have set you back fifteen pounds and twelve shillings. A season ticket, right? <laughs> so this is this is some extraordinary stuff in here. The official program here costs one shilling. One so. Yeah, yeah. There, there are some interesting artefacts, interesting things going on. I also, because I'm a bit of a nerd, I pick up, I I told Kevin this yesterday, I, I found some soccer stars. I don't know if you're a soccer stars fan. So I found a few soccer stars of players who are playing. That's a guy called Peter Simpson, who no one would probably know. This guy you'd know. That, that looks like Charlie George. It is Charlie George? Yeah. Did this Peter, guy, you'll know. Peter Simpson um, spend a little bit of time other than being a footballer? He, was it, was Wasn't it that that Peter Story? Was, was it Peter Story? Oh, okay. Yeah, but I'm up yeah. my yeah. thumb. Nefarious activities we don't need to go into yes, right now. Yeah, and also, yeah. I, I don't want to get done for slander. <laughs> um, <laughs> this guy, he actually scored in the game. Oh. Can you see him? I can, yeah. I, I don't recognise the face. John Radford. Also then I thought John Radford stuff. had longer hair than that. Well, he had a haircut for the photograph. Yeah, yeah. Him. That's Frank McClintock. It is. And then, obviously, the man who was at the back. The great. Ah, yeah, Bob Wilson. Lovely, lovely. I love this picture because his hands look absolutely enormous. I mean, look at them. <laughs> yes. The ball is just sort of like a conker. And then... I've also got him, which you'll That's obviously Bobby know. Yeah, yeah. Bobby. I've got him. Is that Billy Bonds? It is Billy Bonds. And then this one, if you get this, you win a prize. Because he was playing as well. West Ham player in midfield. Ralph Cunt. on to Sheffield Wednesday. No, Peter no. Eustace. Peter Eustace. Peter Eustace. Peter Eustace. So all the soccer stars I've got, um, and I'll, if I if I've got a double, I'll send you one. Um, but <laughs> I haven't got a huge amount, but you, you'll definitely get the program. And as I say, the ticket price. There are some great stuff. There is such. I love reading through these things. One of the things that says because you obviously look at the previous games, and they say little need be said of our win over Crystal Palace. Oh, thanks very much. Cheers. Thanks, <laughs> Arsenal. Um, but this is the. To put in context, Arsenal, as I say, there were only it was one game after this in the, the league. They were tenth. West Ham was seventeenth. There was really not a great deal on it. A couple of questions for you on on your experience. So you went into the away end, I assume, or were you mingling no, with no, Arsenal? We were in the away end, yeah. Yeah. And how was that as an experience? Did you get that feeling this is slightly tense or there's a bit of friction? I mean, early 70s, there could have been some enmity coming from the stands. I I didn't, but then I was so overawed by yeah. the whole experience that I didn't really have very good spidey senses then or now when it comes to uh, what you might call proper naughtiness. In the mm. sense of uh, you know, London, what would have been a London derby, and I, I remember there being a lot of police horses there, and, and wondering to myself, what a horse is doing in London. <laughs> I, I've, I've, I've seen people enough, with dogs yeah. and cats. What yeah. are, are horses? <laughs> this is this is incredible. So, so yeah. um, that that sort of baffled me, but I, mm. I didn't put the two and two together, and I think I was extremely well shepherded. By my uncle yes. Tony, who who himself I suspect um, was was not averse 
uh, if if the opportunity arose to to defend the honour of the club, I think is the the politest way of describing it. Yeah, I once heard a Palace fan uh, uh, in Barnet in the FA Cup, and he just turned round to his mate, and he he was quite a leery chap. He said, "I'm just going up the other end to swap programs," and I thought, <laughs> "You you're not going to swap a program, are you? You're going to do something else." But um, yeah, th- th- there's always that. A lot of people who come onto this pod are of our sort of era, let's call it, you know, so they went to their first game, late 60s, 60s 70s, and there was that tension quite often, which mm. thankfully has gone away mostly. Um, and, and I think Arsenal are an interesting case here because they were actually just about to win their first ever European trophy. And it's mentioned in the programme how they're getting ready for their the Fairs Cup. Always like that name. Yeah. I, bugger the UEFA Cup and Europa League. I know you're a bit of a fan of Europa League. But the Fairs Cup, that just sounded so exotic. Um, and then obviously got merged with the Cup Winners Cup and, and we lost it. But they won it. Um, they were just about to play Ajax in the semi final. And then they eventually beat Anderlecht and oh, the wow. two legs. But uh, the other thing about this programme, which really tickled me, and again, for people who are, who are just listening to this, they won't get it too much. But on the back, you see, you've got the team names. Yes. And if you look at the Arsenal players, number 10 and 11, one's That's called great. George, the other's called Graham. So it's George <laughs> Graham. And I just think, how brilliant is that? Um, so, yeah, there we have your first experience you're in the away and you know, you you probably don't as you say, you see these police horses which you think, oh, last time I saw a thing like that it was at the Epsom Derby. Um did you because your uncle was a West Ham fan, did you go to any more West Ham games with him or was that it? Then that was no, one. That 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 was it because um we then moved to Chelmsford. So right. You know that we we moved effectively yeah, that summer, and uh, the opportunities never sort of arose, um, and I had the opportunity to go and watch what was then Southern League football, mm-hmm. um, and in those days it was deemed to be perfectly normal for you know, an, an eight year old kid to to arrive, park his bicycle out the ground. And 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 this this is going to sound like it's one of those sort of Hovis adverts. Uh, <laughs> you, you'd stand on a milk crate, yeah, on to, so you could see, and um, there was no. You know, my mum and dad thought he's out of the house. He's doing no harm. Uh, yeah, the, yeah, the concept of safeguarding or it's it's too high a risk did, didn't exist in those days, and mm. I, I was just football mad, um, like like all kids were. Um, and it, and, it, and I, I would see old first division and second division football on on match of the day because Ooh. on a Saturday night at the age of eight, I was deemed to be old enough to to babysit my five year old sister. So my mum and dad right. go down the boozer. Yeah, and okay. if you did it today, and, and and this is not me being anyway orientated on the political spectrum. I think you you probably would be reported to the authorities, um, but in those days I could, yeah, I, I could I could I was told don't open the door to strangers. What you watch Kojak or Starsky and Hutch or whatever it was, <laughs> followed by yeah. match of the day, and yeah. I thought I was the most grown up person in the world, and also it allowed me to to go into school on on Monday morning, and and that's what we talk about. Did you see match of the day, or did you watch the big match? And it used to be match of the day because because my mum and dad weren't interested in football, therefore they didn't want to have the big match on because they'd rather have w- watch whatever was on the other side. And it was was only you know, one or two other channels in those days. So yeah. so I, that's why I became a huge uh, follower, you know, a huge believer in in match of the day, and, and still am. Brilliant. Um, now you say you moved to Chelmsford, and that naturally leads us to. Your second game, well, you know, the second game that you remember, which involves Chelsea City. I will point out here, again, being a nerdy journalist, that 
Did you appreciate that Jimmy Greaves played for Chelsea City? I did. Yes. Yes. You did. So, okay. I was aware of that. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I think so. Was, he was uh, there for a season, 76, 77, age 36, and probably not in his prime fitness, but uh, yeah. a nice link with your yeah. first game at Highbury when he played for West Ham. Tell us a little bit about Chelsea City Ipswich, because again, I must say it didn't trigger too many memories, so I had to research this again. Um, yeah, Chum Chumsford were big hitters in the Southern League in those days. Yeah. And the aim was always to get into the Football League. But in those days, it, it wasn't what we have today, which is you know, two up, two down, you know, in, including playoffs and so on. Um, you effectively had to be voted in, or yeah. rather somebody from the, uh, the you know, Division 4 had to be voted out. And it was a bit of a clique between the clubs in Division 4 because they thought, well, if we vote out somebody this year, then mm -hmm. there's a great chance of us being voted out. So it didn't used to happen very often. But Chelmsford were going through a period of time when they were always sort of top two or three as far as the Southern League is concerned. And our big rivals were Hereford United. And oh. Hereford, we, we disliked Hereford intensely because... Yeah. They had that victory against um, Newcastle. Uh, against Newcastle, and all of the attention was on them. Mm -hmm. um, and also, Hereford were promoted to Division Four, effectively on the back of that uh, particular, uh, yeah, spectacular exploit. And you know, I yeah. I can remember, uh, you know, that that goal was Ronnie Radford, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. It, yeah, it was yeah. absolute. It was. It, it, it was a it was a great swing of a leg. Um, it was, it was, and uh, attached to some great commentary, which sort of oh yeah added to it, yeah, enhanced it. Um, so they went up, and Chelmsford never never made it, and they've they're having a good season in twenty three twenty four. Uh, they've got a chance to get make progress in the national league, but um, the match I remember, and it was one of the, one of the very early matches, was. They'd got to the third round of the FA Cup um, and they drew Ipswich Town at wow. home. And Ipswich was seen, this was seen as being, in my head, this was a local derby. Yeah. Because well, they're, they're both more of a local East. derby than Hereford. That's not yes, more of a local. Yes. Um, so. I, I went along, and, and all my mates from school, you know, we, we'd all, you know, some had gone with their mums and dads, or you know, mainly dads those days, of course. Um, I, I went along by myself, and it was a sellout crowd. And Ipswich were far better than Chelmsford, but so so Ipswich won three one comfortably. Um, but it was, a, you know, it was a huge crowd and it was an amazing atmosphere and it was on the television that night yeah. or the following morning or the following afternoon. So, so when I saw, yeah, it was, a, is it, was it, I think it was Whittle Road, New Whittle Road. Um, Great. Uh, Rickle, New Rickle Street, apparently, Rickle Street, opposite yeah. the uh, county cricket ground. Yes, That's yes. So I, used, yeah. I used to go and watch Essex as well uh, mm -hmm. on, on a regular basis by, by myself because I could. Um, yeah. And I remember at the end of the match, um, the I think it's fair to say that the the facilities were fairly rudimentary, mm -hmm. and I fell down the terraces, and it was one of the most mm -hmm. terrifying things. I fell down, went straight down on my face, and there were all of these people, and I, I was rescued by a you know people would just. A, but I was, I thought, she's got me get trampled on here. And he spoke, yeah, picked yeah. me up and stuck me on his shoulders and took me out and dusted me down and said, Are you all right? And I said, Yeah. And yeah. he said, I'll give you a lift. I said, I'll suck, I'm on my bike. But um, it, it was quite a terrifying moment mm. because there were all of these hundreds of people coming towards me and sort of, I, yeah. I felt at the time that that was going to be it. Um, but we, we were beaten by a better team, but we, at Chelmsford, we were playing the Ipswich Town, 
and Absolutely. it was uh, it, it was it was great and and of course by the time you got back to school on Monday it was a Ipswich fluke the victory yeah we'd all convinced <laughs> ourselves that we'd been battering yeah. them for ninety minutes when in reality we hadn't had a chance to lay a glove on them. yeah the the, the 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 difference certainly showed. Yeah, you look at the stats. I mean, there were 15,500, which is a big crowd, I assume, for New Richard oh, yeah. Street. I've never been there. But actually, Ipswich did go three and a half after 75 minutes, and Chelsea scored their goal on the 89th. So I don't <laughs> think <laughs> to say that you Ipswich got away with it would be stretching it somewhat. And obviously, Bobby Mab Bobby Robson was the manager of Ipswich. Yes. They had Mick Mills. Uh, you know, England's national, Trevor Wymark, who I remember, yes. Colin Viljong. So they had finished fourth in the first division and first of the five times she, they were in the top six. So they were, you know, not only a big club, they were a very successful club. But that, that period, it switched and joys where they were, you know, established in the top six in the first division. And, you know, looking at what's going on, uh, these days, they could be back in that that place because they've done incredibly well under Kieran McKenna. I mean, I there are quite a few people on this pod who went to non-league games as their first because it's a gentle introduction. Uh, Jim White, for example, the journalist, went to Altering and Barrow, although he lived very close to Old Trafford and was a man in nice van. His dad thought, right, well, we'll take him to Altering and Barrow. I, I still go to Hendon a fair bit. I just think it's a really, really good thing to do. I mean, we've all been, you know, as Premier League supporters, you get the Premier League experience, but actually going to a non-league ground is actually, it's very different and it, it's almost more entertaining because you're closer, there's, it's more relaxing because you're not thinking, oh my God, we're going to concede another goal in the last <laughs> minute as a Palace fan. Um, but did you, as you were living in Chelsea, did you then go a little bit more, or again that was a bit of a one-off? Oh you no, I, I started drifted. to become I started to become a regular. Um, oh okay. Because what else were you going to do on a Saturday afternoon? You know, I hmm. I, I, I wasn't interested in wrestling. So therefore, Dickie Davis and World of Sport never yeah. appealed to me. Um, I wasn't interested in horses, so you know that that so grandstand was out. Um, yeah. And I'd save up my pocket money, and I'd cycle down, and and I was you know a regular, and uh, until you know un, until my dad's my dad's job took him elsewhere, um, mm -hmm. and, and we moved away. I'd, I'd probably be a fan. Yeah, we'd stayed there. I'd still be a fan of them. It was. It, it was it was our club, and I, and I, I've always, it's not it's not a sneery attitude. I always think that your town and your football club of your town is is part of you, and and that's mm. why it always slightly baffles me why somebody would choose to go and support a club, you know, one hundred and fifty or two hundred miles away. But I understand it. You know, we all mm. like to live our lives vicariously through success and being a Chelmsford City fan would not, not have brought me a lot of joy and success in, in terms of that. But you do have that sense of belonging that football mm. gives you that, that nothing else does. You know, I'm, I, I live close to Brighton, yet I work in Liverpool yeah. purely because of the football club. And I'm supposed to be, you know, I'm supposed to be an academic. I'm supposed to, supposed to be a rational sensible human being what a spectacularly dumb thing to do with your life you know com commuting <laughs> 500 miles a week to, to work and back yeah is really silly 